Hey, we are excited to have you with us today. Everybody online, we're glad you could be with us here today as well. So um, I'm not a super adventurous person. I'm pretty vanilla, white bread in most aspects of my life. But sometimes I like to pretend to be adventurous, like when we go out to eat. I'll search the menu and I'll find an unfamiliar dish that I think this is exciting. I'm going to get this one. This is what I'm going to order. You know, and it's, it's usually something that's, you know, I can kind of guess what it's going to taste like, but I say I pretend to be adventurous because uh, I never order that. Um, and it's, it's never fails. Lindsay will ask me, what are you going to get? I'll say, well, I'm going to get this exciting option. And she just kind of rolls her eyes and goes, yeah, okay, sure. And that's what I really intend to get. Honestly, in that moment, I'm, I'm committed to that. But as soon as those words come out of my mouth, I start wrestling in my brain. I'm like, well, do, do I want that? Is that going to taste the way I thought it is? Is that going to upset my little delicate tum-tum? Like, what's going to happen here? And I just start wrestling with these questions. So by the time the waiter comes up and says, end for you, nine times out of ten, buffalo chicken wrap is the words that I'm going to say. Because that's my go-to. That's safe. I know that's going to be good almost anywhere, Right? I like to pretend to be adventurous, but honestly, I'm just, I'm kind of afraid to commit to that dish. I'm at the point in my life where if I'm going to go out to eat, I, I want to guarantee that it's going to be good, that it's going to taste good, right? It's that fear of commitment that kind of just works in my life and shows up in that particular way. And maybe you resonate with that. Maybe you go out to eat, you have that wrestling match, maybe not. But I'm willing to bet that we all have this aversion to commitment that shows up in different ways. Maybe for you, it's a social engagement. You've got a friend or a coworker or even a family member that says, hey, we're going to do this thing. You want to come out with us this weekend? And part of you wants to. Part of you wants to go. You think it'd be great. But then there's also part of you that's like, I don't know. Like, what if something else comes up? What if I really don't want to go do that thing? And so we come up with the excuse, well, let me check my calendar. Let me talk to my wife, see what's going on. We've all got that, that go-to thing. And we, we really, it boils into an aversion to commitment. We don't want to commit ourselves to something. Or maybe it's even more silly. My wife, uh, she, she loves temporary tattoos. Right now she's got a whole sleeve of temporary tattoos. She orders them off Amazon. It's fun for her because she loves the idea of tattoos. But she doesn't want to commit to a piece of art for the rest of her life. And honestly, I can't blame her. I can't imagine doing that. Some of you have tattoos. You're brave people, right? It's that fear of commitment. It shows up in small, kind of silly ways. But it shows up in our lives in some larger and honestly some more detrimental ways as well. We can look at it at a statistical level, something like volunteerism. The U.S. government really didn't start tracking volunteerism until about the year 2000. And they found at that point about 20, I think 28, almost 29% of the U.S. population was involved in some sort of formal volunteerism, either with a religious or a service organization. So about 29%. That's, that's a good number of people, right? And those volunteer hours, that's what makes a number of social services and charities and good works possible in our society. So that's good. But ever since the year 2000, that number has continually and um, steadily decreased. We get the year 2005, we find that only about 25% of the American population volunteered. The year 2021 is down to 23%. I don't know what this year's statistic is, but I would bet dollar to donuts, it's probably continued that trend and decreased. And this isn't because people have become less caring about good works or charitable deeds. We look at another figure, the number of dollars given to charitable organizations. That number has continually increased since the year 2000. 2000, it was just a little over $200 billion. I think it was $203.3 billion were donated to charitable causes. 2021, it was nearly $500 billion. It's $499 some odd billion dollars donated. Now that's almost... It's more than double an increase. It's not that people care less. It's not that people don't want good things to happen. It's just that, well, it's a lot easier to commit your money than it is to commit your time or your energy or your schedule. Commitment is the issue. We can look at it in a different perspective or a different facet. We look at something like marriage. The average age for marriage has, uh, sorry, I'm having a hard time talking, continually increased uh, since the 60s, really, but within the last 25 years, it, it's been a more of a sharper increase. In the year 2000, again, the year, uh, we'll just focus on that. It was the average age, somewhere in your mid-20s, depending on if you're a man or a woman. If you're a woman, it was a little lower, about 21, 22. If you're a man, it was like 25, 26, somewhere in there. But if we were to look at last year's numbers, the average age is almost 30. Again, about 28 if you're a female, 31, 32 if you're a male. And there are a number of things that contribute to this. There's social factors, economic factors, for sure. 
But at least for the millennial demographic, my generation, a large factor of this avoidance or this hesitancy seems to be commitment. Have you heard of this? It's a really tall niche organization. You may not have heard of it called eHarmony.com. Anybody familiar with eHarmony? They did a survey of millennials. Why are you delaying marriage? There are a number of different responses given. We found 30% of millennials say that they just don't feel equipped to navigate a long-term relationship like that. So basically, I don't, I don't know if I can. 10% were brutally honest. They just said, I can't imagine being with one person for the rest of my life. In both instances, there's this aversion to commitment at work, sometimes in very large, blunt levels, right? Whatever the, the category, whatever facet of our lives, we have this aversion to commitment. We're hesitant to jump in because honestly, commitment is intimidating. It demands something of us. In many instances, it demands us to be somewhat exclusive, to say yes to something at the expense of saying no to something else. And that can be a little a little scary sometimes, which is why it fits so well into the sermon series that we're going to wrap up today called Courageous. For six weeks, we've been working through the book of Joshua. And throughout this book, what we've seen is that God walks with his people. And he doesn't just walk through the good times or the easy times. He walks through difficult times. And even those moments of life where we come into contact with the sources of our deep fears. And every time we find that his presence is enough to overcome, to make us courageous, We've seen it in the story of his people in Israel, and we've seen that it's still true today in our individual lives. And today we're going to be continuing that story and ending it, actually, Joshua chapter 24. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to open those up. You can follow along in Joshua 24. If you don't have your Bible, you can follow along on the screen behind. We also have the FCC Monmouth app. You can download that, and the sermon note should be the very first item on the home screen. Just tap that. You'll find an outline along with our passages pulled open, ready for you to follow along with. Like we said, commitment is the subject of our conversation, and commitment is challenging. It's intimidating, and our spiritual lives are not an exception to any of this. We have an aversion in in our everyday lives. We have an aversion in our spiritual lives at times to practice commitment. In fact, I would argue that's probably the number one spiritual challenge across the world. It's not a matter of belief. It's a matter of commitment. The world is a surprisingly spiritual place. We may doubt that sometimes, but on a global scale, about 85% of the global population believes in some sort of spiritual reality, and that's a conservative estimate. 85%, that's, that's a lot. Sometimes we worry about atheism and this growing idea that fewer and fewer people are believing in God. Atheism is like the furthest thing on my worried list. It's like 7 to 10% of the population, that's including agnostics in many figures, And they're oftentimes located in very specific geographic regions. It's more of a cultural issue than anything. But really, the world is a surprisingly spiritual place. In fact, a large number of people on the planet even specifically have a belief in Jesus. Now, Christians, we can look at that figure. 30 to 33% of the global population, obviously, we believe in Jesus. But even outside of our faith, we could look at the Muslims They have a belief in Jesus. They believe that he was a prophet from God. They believe that he was a holy man, that he was to be revered and to be honored. They believe that his teachings are to be respected. That's about 25, if we're being conservative, 25% of the global population. Look at the world's third largest religion, Hinduism. They have absolutely no problem squeezing Jesus into their hundreds of thousands of different deities and gods. They would believe, yeah, sure, throw him in there. He's, He's God too. That's 15% of the population. 70% of the earth has some belief in Jesus. Belief is not the problem for us. It's commitment. That's the struggle. And it's always been the struggle, honestly. We can look at Joshua, and we can see even at the end of their story, after they've been been through so much with God, it's commitment that they wrestle with. Just catch us up to speed in case you've missed some of it or you're just unfamiliar. Joshua is a story in which God calls his people, the nation of Israel, to go and to take possession of the land of Canaan, what we call the promised land. It's land that he promised to give to them hundreds of years beforehand. And he leads them into the land and he leads them into battle and he gives them victory after victory. And by the time we get to the end of the book of Joshua, they've pretty much conquered the land. There's some patches that still got to be taken care of, but things are looking good. And it's time for everybody to go home, to go to their new lands that they possess and to, to build a life that is pleasing and honoring to the Lord. But before they do, Joshua, the leader of the nation, 
he has this farewell speech because he's an old man at this point. He's, he's kind of on his deathbed. And so he gives them this last challenge, this last bit of leadership. And in this speech, it starts in Joshua 23, he reminds them who the Lord is and how the Lord has brought them through and how he's responsible for their victories and how he's been faithful to them. And then he turns his attention to the people specifically. And here's his challenge, verse 14. He says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors that they serve beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua issues this challenge to the people. And it's not a challenge to start believing in Yahweh, the God of Israel. Obviously, they believed in the God of the Bible. They, they followed him this entire way. It's not even a challenge to stop believing in all of the other gods that existed or that they believed existed in the world. Like ancient people, they had no problem believing that the gods of Babylon were real and the gods of Egypt were real and the God of Israel was real. The challenge is not belief. The challenge that Joshua issues is one of commitment. Follow the Lord. Serve him exclusively. Throw away all of the other idols. Throw away all of the other faith. Throw away all of the other obedience and service to any other God and just commit yourselves wholeheartedly to the Lord, to the God of Israel. He even goes a little step further. He says, if you're not going to commit to him, then pick whatever needless idol you're going to follow and commit to them. But don't pretend. Don't go halfway. Don't give half-heartedly to the Lord and say, oh yeah, we're going to follow you. It's a challenge to commit. Because as we said, commitment is our main struggle. It still is today. We listed off all those different people, groups, and faiths that have some sort of belief in Jesus. Belief isn't the issue, it's commitment. Islam is a nation that has some belief in Jesus. Obviously, they're not committed to him, though. You will never hear a Muslim say that Jesus is the divine Son of God, that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. You'll never hear a Hindu person say that he is the one and only God. You'll never hear them affirm his words in John 14, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father except through me. That's far too exclusive for Hinduism. There's a belief, but there's not commitment from these people. And even you and I, as Christians, obviously we believe in Jesus. We pledge ourselves to him. We say he is our God, he is our king, he is our Lord. But even for you and I, it's commitment that we wrestle with and commitment that we struggle with. Not commitment on whether we will bend the knee to some statue or some false religion, but a deeper, more sinister kind of commitment that we wrestle with. There's a division in our hearts that's a great struggle. We can see it in an example, an unfortunate example uh, a man named Rabbi Zacharias, he was a great apologist that recently passed away. His ministry was to write books, was to lecture, was to debate, was to defend the faith. And he was incredibly brilliant and incredibly good at it. I mean, he, he helped thousands and thousands of people come to faith in Jesus and helped thousands more have a firm foundation to know why they believe what they believe and to be built up in confidence that this really is something worth holding on to. I say he's an unfortunate example because, unfortunately, there was a portion of Robbie's life that really nobody was aware of until after his passing. Robbie was a successful businessman, and, and as a successful man, he diversified his investments. Some of his diversification went into businesses that he owned, at least partially owned. And some of those businesses were day spas. He had some in the United States. He had some in Asia. And he would use these day spas as locations where he would uh, pursue... Uh, personal and adult gratification from the massage therapists. And oftentimes he would pressure them, he would pay for their schooling and their housing to help them get started, and then sort of coerce them into saying, I've given you so much, you, you really need to pay me back. And sometimes he would leverage his, his prowess, he would say, I just really need you to help me carry the burden of my ministry, I just need some release. And other times he would just extort them and say, if you tell anybody, thousands of people will probably leave the faith and that's on you. And he would use his position and his, his influence in very gross ways to manipulate and abuse people. His phone contained hundreds and hundreds of images of, of different women. And none of this was known until after his passing. And it's incredibly sad because Ravi's legacy will no longer be one of this great 
apologist, this great committed person who was strong in the Lord and helped other people in the faith, his legacy will be a cautionary tale for each of us. And perhaps he's an extreme example, but he's nonetheless an example of a tendency that you and I have to wrestle with. The great challenge to our devotion and our commitment does not come in the form of little statues or false religions. The great challenge for you and I today comes in those often overlooked portions of our life that we keep separated from God. Ravi was a committed man, but obviously there was a portion of his life that he kept uncommitted, separated, selfishly to himself. And you and I, we have that same tendency. Now we may hear that, we go, well, there's no, I don't have any uncommitted parts of my life. Everything I have, it's, it's all in. I'm all in for God, right? That's why I call them often overlooked. It's not always as obvious in the cases of Ravi Zacharias. Sometimes the overlooked parts of our life, we don't pay attention to them just because they're so normal. They're so ingrained into the everyday fabric of our normal lives. We don't even think to assess them. They're not even on our radar. And we actually see that happen in the people of Israel as well as the story continues. Joshua, he issues this challenge. Will you commit yourselves wholeheartedly to the Lord? And the people, they go, yes, absolutely we will. We are all in with the Lord, ride or die. He's our guy. We're exclusive with him. And here's Joshua's surprising response in verse 19. Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord. He's a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he's been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. And then Joshua said, you're witnesses against yourselves that you've chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are, that's a present tense verb, guys, that are currently among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. Joshua's words are kind of shocking, right? Like, they're like, we're all in. We will devote ourselves. And Joshua says, I doubt it. Now, why wouldn't he be more encouraging in a moment like that? And why wouldn't he get in their corner and say, all right, guys, you got it. You can do this. Why would he respond? "Ah, eh, Probably not. It's because of what we read in verse 24. It's, just, it's a really small, just kind of short statement. We're tempted to just gloss over it and move forward, but it's so revealing as to what is happening in the people's hearts in that moment, and honestly, what has always been happening throughout the entire book of Joshua. We need to remind ourselves that these people, they have witnessed the miracles of God, and not even like small miracles. Like sometimes you hear people have this terminal illness, and then they're miraculously healed, and they're all better. That's a miracle. Praise God for that. But that's something that happens like one person's life, right? And it's kind of this small personal thing. This is like huge, large-scale stuff. They watched the Lord stop a river. It stopped flowing. It dried up. They walked across the riverbank. They watched the Lord blow up the walls of Jericho after they blew some ram's horns. Like they have witnessed some massive things. They have witnessed the Lord's presence walk with them as they had victory after victory after over armies that they had no business having victory. Nations that were stronger and more powerful and better equipped than them. They had conquest because the Lord was with them. And they've seen the flip side of it all too. They've seen what happens when you are unfaithful to the Lord and you break the covenant. They watched a man named Achan steal the devoted things that were supposed to be destroyed and the Lord's wrath fell upon the nation of Israel and specifically on Achan and his entire family. They've seen the whole gamut. They know who the Lord is and yet, despite all of this experience, in this very moment, as they're saying, we will serve the Lord, there are presently, currently, idols to false gods on their person. The cognitive dissonance is staggering. It's like a climate change activist who is lecturing you on how you need to reduce your carbon emissions and then they get into a luxury SUV that gets one mile a gallon and puts down the road to the next city. What? Like what? Some, this doesn't pass the smell test. How could they be so obtuse in this moment? And the answer is not complicated, honestly. It's because this way of life was normal. It's something that you and I, we probably, we struggle to grasp, but 
idolatry, they wouldn't call it idolatry, they would call it pluralism or, or, or polytheism. It was common in every single culture and every single people group in the entirety of the ancient Near East to have more than one God. Of course there's more than one God, right? You got the river, you got the sun, the moon, the harvest. All. How could one God handle all this? They had multiple gods in every culture. Israel was really weird. They were incredibly strange in the fact that they were called to worship only one God. It was just normal to worship all these other gods. That's why they never stopped to question it. They never stopped to assess and to think, well, maybe, we, maybe normal isn't how I ought to be living. The struggle was commitment because it was so ingrained into the fabric of their everyday lives. And honestly, church, we struggle in the same way. So many times, the things that we just consider normal, we don't even stop to assess or to think about. And in reality, many times, these are Jesus' number one competition for our devotion and our commitment. Let's take something real ubiquitous. Let's take a busy schedule. There's many, many examples we could look at. But we're just going to look at this one because almost everybody will get this. A busy schedule. We're busy, guys, right? I don't know anybody who's not busy. We're busy with, with work stuff. We're busy with kid stuff. We're busy with ball games and extracurriculars. We're busy with after school activities. We're busy, busy with, with home maintenance. We're busy with just doing chores and keeping up on stuff. We're busy with social engagements. We're busy with uh, extended family things, anniversaries, parties, so on. We're busy with, uh, did I say vacations? You know, sometimes we'll squeeze a vacation in there. We're busy with that. We're, we're busy all the time. Sometimes we're busy with church stuff, right? We have no shortage of things to jam pack our weeks and months with. And all of the things I've just mentioned are good. There's not a one of those things that's bad. This is not a struggle between something that's good and something that's bad. That's easy to spot. We look at the thing in our life and go, yeah, that's probably destructive. That's not going to benefit me at all. And we cut it out. That's easy. That's not where the struggle is. We struggle and oftentimes overlook these challenges because it's not bad. It's really a struggle between what is good and what is best doing what is most necessary. It's kind of like the parable of the farmer. It's a guy who had this, this farm that he owned and worked, and it came time. He had these fruit trees on the edge of the property. It came time to go pick them because the fruit was ripe. It was ready to pick, and so he told his wife, I'm going to hop in the truck and go get that this morning. And so he did. He got out to the truck, but he didn't get very far because he had to drive past the chicken coop, and he noticed that the chickens hadn't been fed this morning. So he said, well, I better do that. So he diverted the truck. He went to the barn to pick up a sack of feed. But when he got there, he noticed that mice had started to chew holes in the sacks. He thought, well, I better take care of that. So he abandoned the sacks of feed. He went searching the barn for mousetraps. And when he found that he was out of mousetraps, he said, well, I better go to the hardware store and I better buy some. So he hopped in the truck and he drove into town. But as he did, he noticed, I'm kind of low on gas. And so he abandoned the trip to the hardware store and he went to the gas station. And he got to the gas station, he's pumping gas, and he realized, you know what, I'm kind of hungry. So he went inside, and he got himself a soda and a slice of breakfast pizza for like five bucks, because Casey's was having a special. And by the time he had finished eating, he realized it was almost noon. And he had done absolutely nothing he set out to do. And he became increasingly frustrated when he realized that the heat of the day had started to climb, and that fruit that was so ripe and ready to pick had likely fallen off the tree, splat on the ground, and was ruined. Now, none of the things the farmer sought out to do were bad, were they? They're all good. They all had different degrees of necessity, too. But how many of us can relate with this guy? Our days are so full and so busy of things that are good and things that are important, and yet the thing that's most necessary, the best thing, oftentimes suffers as a result. It gets pushed to the side. Busyness, so many times, is what distracts us and competes with Christ for our devotion and commitment. How many times has a busy schedule kept us from sitting and enjoying the presence of the Lord? Now, maybe that means Bible reading. Maybe that means prayer time. Maybe that means you just sit on your porch and you just reflect in silence. How often does that get pushed to the side? Because we just have so much to do. And not bad stuff. Good things that compete with what is best? Or how many times does service get pushed to the sideline because we're so busy? And that might mean just helping your neighbor out with something. 
That might mean fixing a meal for your coworker who's got a really rough family situation that they're working through. Might mean you dedicate some time to a ministry team at church. You know, the kinds of things that we're called to do to express our love in practical, tangible ways to the people around us. How many times does that important thing get pushed to the side, not by bad things, but by busyness of everyday normal life? Or gathering to worship, meeting around the Lord's table to partake of the body and the blood of Jesus, one of the only two sacraments that he committed us to before he left. How many times does that get set to the side because we've got travel ball or we've got weekend plans? Not bad things, by the way, but certainly not best things. I'll tell you, statistically, it's about 50% of the time. Average, committed, somebody who identifies as a committed, solid believer in Jesus is at church two Sundays out of a month, 50% of the time. Let me ask you, I'm married to a wonderfully understanding woman, but if I were committed to my wife 50% of the time, would I still be married to that wonderfully understanding woman? Probably not. And this is admittedly a soapbox for me, so I will spare you the brunt of it. Suffice to say, maybe this is worth chewing on. Because there are things in our life that jam-pack our schedules, and they're good. They're not bad. But neither are they best. And many times they become the number one competition for our devotion, for our affections, for our priority. And they are often overlooked and seen as innocuous and non-threatening. That's what I mean when I say the challenge to our commitment today is not in the form of little statues and false religions. It is in the often overlooked parts of our lives that we just keep separate. We would do well to remember Joshua's words. He is a jealous God. And we sometimes think jealousy, that's not a becoming quality. That's not a good thing. But in this instance, it is an appropriate thing. He is a God that does not share. Not when it comes to the devotion of his people. He is a God that did not give us part of himself, but gave us his totality. He sought us. He sent his son into this world. And Jesus, he wasn't just a man. We read Colossians chapter 1. Paul writes, God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him. The fullness of God, not the partiality or the partialness, the fullness of God sought us and pursued us. The fullness of God died on a cross so that the fullness of our sin could be atoned for and washed away. Not just some of our sinfulness, not just the easy stuff to forgive, not just the easy stuff that we can just atone for. You told a little white lie, you stub your toe and said a four-letter word. All of it. The nasty stuff. The dark stuff. The most broken aspects of our being was paid for in its totality when the fullness of God died on a cross and raised back to life. He is not a God that does things halfway. He pursues us with all that he is, and he calls us to pursue him with all that we are. He's a jealous God, and it's totally appropriate. That's why to that end, I guess my hope and my encouragement for this morning is that we would make a choice, the kind of choice that Joshua calls the people of Israel to, that we would draw a line in the sand, and that we would say, as for me and my house, We will serve the Lord, that we would commit ourselves to him wholeheartedly. And sometimes that means practicing something that we're going to call a holy no. Sometimes to be committed, we practice a holy no. What is a holy no? We live in a society where the expectation is yes. There are demands on our time, and we're expected to say yes Yeah, I can probably fit that in. Yeah, I can work that in my schedule. Yeah, I can bump this or push that. Yeah, I can probably do one more thing. The expectation is yes, because if you say no, well, then you've let somebody down or you've disappointed them, or maybe you're even seen as irresponsible or uncaring or unqualified. The expectation is no, or is yes. No, nobody says no. Or morally speaking, we're a very libertine society. And the expectation is that we will say yes. Yes, when a desire comes up. Yes, when an opportunity comes up. Yes, when I want something, I I should say yes to that and and gratify that, right? Because if you say no, then you're kind of prudish, or you're kind of stodgy, or you're restrictive, or you're regressive, right? We want to be free, and so free means saying yes. 
Or even people that we love and that we care about in our lives. They make demands of us or expectations of us or requests of us, of our time, of our energy, of our resources, of our emotional capacity. Well, can you do this for me? Aren't you happy for me? I made this choice. Will you celebrate with me? And sometimes we can say yes, but sometimes yes actually encourages that which destroys, that which is misguided, that which should not be celebrated. But the expectation is that you'll say yes, because if you don't, well, you're kind of unsupportive or unloving or judgmental or whatever. Yes is the expectation of our society. But here's the uncomfortable, yet nonetheless unavoidable truth. Every time we say yes to one thing, we are simultaneously saying no to something else. Every time when we say yes to one thing, we say no to something else. Let me give you an example. I have two sons, eight and almost five. Both of them love pizza. Shocking, I know. There's one morning, I forget where my wife was, she was doing something. So it was just me and the boys. We had leftover pizza in the fridge. And my oldest, when I woke up, because he wakes up super early, he goes, Dad, can I have pizza for lunch? Because that's where his brain is. And I was like, yeah, sure thing. You got it, man. You can have pizza for lunch. So we're going about our day. And my youngest son comes up to me at lunchtime and says, Dad, I want pizza for lunch. I go, you got it, man. No problem, right? I've told both sons yes. I have a problem. I open the pizza box. I do not have enough pizza for two boys. I have to make a choice. I can give the pizza to one son and say yes, but I'm saying no to the other one. I could give the pizza to the youngest one, but then I'm saying no to the other son. I have to make a choice, right? Now, in this particular instance, I just gave both of them an insufficient amount of pizza and said, if you don't complain, you can have ice cream afterwards. That was the solution to that problem, right? But that doesn't work in my life because I can't split my life in half. I can't give an insufficient portion of my heart, mind, soul, and strength to a jealous God who does not share. I have to make a choice. And if I'm saying yes to all of these other things, many times I am making the choice to say no to him. When my schedule is full and someone makes another demand for another activity, another appointment, another engagement, another thing, when I say yes to that, I'm saying no to him. In my moral life, when I make a choice to indulge my flesh, when I pursue this craving, when I have one more drink, one more lover, one more lie, one more whatever, when I say yes to my flesh, I'm saying no to him. In my social life, with my, my people that I love, when they make demands, when they make expectations, when they ask, and I say, yeah, son, we definitely can sign up for that travel ball team, even though we will miss two months of church. Yes, honey, I'm super happy for you for moving in with your boyfriend and pursuing this lifestyle. When I say yes to those things, I'm saying no to righteousness in the ways that God calls me to live. When I say yes to one thing, I say no to something else. It cannot be avoided. There is a choice that has to be made. Because I can't divide my heart in half, not for a jealous God. Sometimes the holiest thing I could do in my life is to say no. No, I cannot pack my schedule full with yet another thing. Because I want to say yes to the Lord. No, I cannot indulge that craving, that desire, that flesh, that morality. I cannot say yes because I want to say yes to him. No, I cannot be happy for you. I'm sorry. I love you. I enjoy you. You mean so much to me. But no, we're not going to sign up for travel ball because we're going to church. I'm sorry, but no, I, I cannot celebrate this life decision because I don't believe that this is in your best interest. I have to say no because I want to say yes to him. There are times in our lives where the holiest thing we could do is practice a holy no. Make the choice. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's scary. That's intimidating. Because it requires commitment. And commitment always asks something of us. It asks for devotion. Sometimes it asks for sacrifice. Commitment is challenging. But as we have seen throughout Joshua, and as you review your life, I'm sure you will see in your own experience, when we walk with the Lord, he meets us, not just in the good times, but in the bad times, and even in those moments 
where we come into contact with our deep fears. If the book of Joshua has taught us anything, I hope it is this. His presence really is enough. And so church, I, I just leave us with this. I want to challenge us to draw a line in the sand and to commit. To comb through the parts of our lives, even those often overlooked normal parts of life with a fine tooth comb and ask ourselves, is this keeping me from being committed? Is this innocuous part of my life that seems so normal actually something that is competing with Christ for my attention and my affections? Because belief is not the struggle, church. It's commitment. My challenge is go through your life and make that commitment. This morning, maybe the commitment you want to make is, is one to embrace Christ as your Savior. And you've decided, I do want to walk with the, with the Lord. I want to walk with Jesus. I, I want to taste the goodness of the gospel. If that's you, I encourage you, there's a connection card on the back of the seat in front of you. You can take that. Just put your name, your number on there. And say, I want to talk about Jesus. I would love to have a conversation with you about what that means to be committed to the Lord and why it is the greatest decision you could ever make for your life. For some of us, maybe we, we're already following the Lord. We believe we are committed, but we just need to do a tune-up. We need to assess and reflect, maybe practice a holy no so that we can say yes to a greater devotion, a greater fellowship with the Lord. I don't know where you're at this morning. We're all in different places. We're all on our own journey, but we all have a next step to make. And so I would encourage you to have the courage to take that step. This morning, we're going to celebrate with a young woman who is going to take that step. Her name is Dari. You can come on up here. Dari is a friend of mine. She is in my small group. We've known each other for several years now. And Dari has come to the point in her faith where it is an act of obedience and commitment. She wants to be immersed in the waters of baptism. And so, but Dari, for the benefit of everyone here, I'm going to ask you to repeat the good confession after me. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my Savior. Congratulations. Head on back up. You can head on back and get changed. We're going to have the pleasure of celebrating with heaven this morning in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but as we do, let me just say a word of prayer before we get to that, and then we're going to sing a bit. Father, we thank you for being committed to your people. You are a jealous God, and we do read of, of the demands that you have for your people, and it is intimidating at times, but it is it is a challenge we welcome with open arms because along with your demands comes your grace and your love. You are a God who walks with us. You are a God who forgives us. You're a God who grants us second, third, fourth chances. You call us to something great because you care. Your dream for our life is that we would taste to know that the Lord is good. And so we celebrate this morning as Dari takes this step, but we also pray for our own hearts and minds that we would follow you in obedience and with passion we would be committed, that we would experience the blessings of realizing your dream for our lives, that we would know the goodness of your presence, that we'd be refreshed and encouraged by it, and that your spirit would grant us the courage and the faithfulness to walk with you in obedience this day and every day that follows. In the name of Christ, we pray these things. Amen. Would you stand? So we're going to sing a song that...